Tonight, our speaker is Dr. Melissa Sefkin, Principal Researcher at Nissan Research Center, Silicon Valley. Dr. Sefkin leads the human-centered systems practice at the Research Center, which focuses on exploring the potential future of having autonomous vehicles, or AEV, I bet you'll be talking about AEV a lot, uh, as interactive agents in the world. Because for there's going to be a long time where only some of the cars are autonomous and the rest of us are driven by crazy people like us. And so she's going to talk about how these uh, independent agents interact with somewhat unpredictable human beings. Um, Dr. Sefkin, who received her doctorate in anthropology from Rice University, terrific department by the way, came to Nissan from IBM Research. Prior to that, she was director of advanced research and user experience at Sapient Corporation, and she was a senior research scientist at the Institute for Research and Learning. She's a Fulbright Award grantee and author of many publications. Um, serving in leadership roles in uh, various committees related to, to applied anthropology, which is a really hot area um, for those of us who are anthropologists who actually want like a living wage. Um, and so she's really pioneering the, the, this area where, and convincing people in industry that anthropologists have something important to contribute to um, technology and other aspects of uh, industry. The title of her talk tonight is Walk, Don't Walk, Everyday Interactions with Self-Driving Cars. Please join me in welcoming Melissa Sefkin. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here and thank you for coming out for this talk. I'm really thrilled to be able to inaugurate this talk series on designing the future um, hosted by this amazing organization that I've been so pleased to be able to come visit, the School for Advanced Research. And really, it's an honor for me to be here. So I live in a world of technologists, of entrepreneurs, and of visionaries. And these are people who are always looking ahead. They exist around the world. I think many of you probably in this room tonight are amongst them. They're pointing ahead, trying to create the future, and they want to believe that they are really the people who are designing this future. But I want to ask, when is the future? And who's actually doing the designing? So the loftiness of this environment notwithstanding, and I've been warned a lot about the elevation, and I do feel it a bit, I, I want to explore these questions about when is the future and who's doing the designing through the lens of some rather mundane things, the car, the street, and our encounters with them. So in fact, for autonomous vehicles, of which I am one, for developers of them, getting these encounters right is not that easy, even just the simple act of stopping or going. So let's take a quick look at what happens on the street. This is a scene from Sao Paulo, Brazil. A car pulls up. Imagine it's an autonomous vehicle. It sees people on the road. It sees pedestrians. But actually, this guy maybe isn't really just a normal pedestrian. He's not going all the way across the road. We might have to predict that somebody would stop right there in the crosswalk. And we see that he's actually a juggler. From the social standpoint, we notice that the streets are not just places to move about for cars and pedestrians and bicycles, but they're places of entertainment. <clears throat> they're also places, as we notice, as he finishes what he's doing, they're places of labor. And he's out there not just to entertain, of course, but to make some money. So as he finishes, the question I would ask if I'm sitting in that car, imagine it's a robotic vehicle and it's a robotic taxi, what we call robo-taxis. It's sitting there and I want to know, is it going to stay stopped long enough for me to give him a tip? What if it assumes I'm going to give him a tip, but I actually don't want to and it makes it really awkward for me as I sit there and it assumes I'm going to roll down the window and give something to him. Getting these things right, getting these relational moments that we find on the road are not that easy. So let's take a look at another one. Maybe some of you have seen this video. This is San Francisco in 1906. And what I think you immediately notice is how different the patterns of action and movement are on the roads. Yeah, generally have a right-hand side and a left-hand side, 
But beyond that, there's really no order that we can discern to who's going where and when. It's a bit of a free-for-all as everybody moves about. <laughs> so today I want to explore further what it will mean and what it will feel like in the future as we have autonomous vehicles or increasingly automated vehicles on the road moving about in the worlds that we inhabit. Why is this important? It's important because we build social relations in and through the technical and material world that we move in. In the words of the sociologist Bruno Latour, we live not just in intersubjective worlds or intersubjective lives relating person to person, but we also live interobjective lives, meaning where we deal constantly with objects, material things in our midst. And those participate too in our relationships and how we make meaning in the world. So as, as, uh, as it was introduced by Michael, um, I talk a lot about AV. AV are autonomous vehicles, the technical term, a more generic term than self-driving cars. There's a lot of politics around exactly what term gets used. Um, but these AV will participate in rearranging the socio-technical worlds that we live in, as I've mentioned. They have aspirations, or the developers for them have aspirations that the way in which they participate in these rearrangements will be quite grand and profound. Even if it ends up that they just shift things in some small ways, they are likely to make some shifts. So today I want to focus on two ways in which I think that they could shift our sense of our, the, the lives we live, the socio-material way in which we, we exist in the world. The first is through the personal and the individual. Specifically, I want to think about, or have us think about, what does it mean to a self, to a person's own sense of identity? to be interacting with more autonomy through these vehicles. <clears throat> they have great promise of offering in increased mobility to the disabled, to the elderly, maybe to children, to really free up and liberate people who today maybe don't have as much access to mobility. They also have the promise, or some people think the killer app of these, these autonomous vehicles is that it'll let us do things like watch movies or read books or, God forbid, do some work in the vehicle rather than drive. And what I want to ask is how might that shape or reconfigure how we think about ourselves? Again, what kind of, we're people with sense of capabilities and accountabilities and responsibilities, and does it shift when we're no longer responsible as drivers? The second concern that I'll take us into is to think more about that social world of the streets and what happens on the road. The streets are where we encounter all sorts of streams of humanity. I think it's essential to our sense of, of being human beings. For, for both positive and negative reasons, it's where we encounter the all walks of life. And a lot of that is shaped in some very specific ways through our sense of place, of what kind of place I'm in and what's happening there. Think about when you travel to different kinds of places, you sense that difference in the, in the feeling of a place. You absorb it almost first by being on the roads, maybe in the airport, but probably once you get out on the roads. Is that going to shift? Is it going to feel different as we move about and there's more autonomous systems that might operate very much the same everywhere that are on the roads? The approach that my colleagues and I bring to this development is, is, again, through the lens of the everyday. When we view the future through the lens of the everyday, we have to realize that the future is made. It's being created step by step, practice by practice, as we do things in the world. It doesn't arrive fully formed. We don't wake up one day and land in the future. We, we did our laundry the day before. We're still living the regular lives we're living. And it's made by all of us. It's made as people put new technology and things into the world, but then we interact with them. That's how the future gets made. And that's what this quote points to. Futures are not understood as striking visions created and implemented by scientists or designers, but rather as collaborative explorations of situated possibilities 
formations and actions at the intersection of design in everyday life. This quote comes from a very new volume called Design Anthropological Futures, written by people, anthropologists much like myself, who work at this intersection between design technology and thinking about the future. <clears throat> so I think that this also points to why it's important then to begin to bring an anthropological perspective into these technological developments. When we pay close attention to things that go on in the world, in cars, on the streets, how, how people occupy space and move about space, we begin to see just how profoundly cultural and social all of these things are. And that, I believe, we can't leave the development of what comes next just to the technologist. So what do I actually do? Uh, let me, before I go on and talk more about the self and that sense of shifting identity that might occur in, in the streets and the social life on the streets, let me just tell you a little bit both about the work that I do and the team I lead as well as autonomous vehicles themselves. So this is the one part that you'll get a little bit of the technology stuff on autonomous vehicles. I lead, as, a, as a Michael had introduced, a small group of researchers, we call ourselves the Human-Centered Systems Group at the Nissan Research Center in Silicon Valley. And we bring a range of social and cultural research methodologies and approaches to our work. Uh, and we take a very human-centered approach. We put at the center of our analysis pedestrians, drivers, people on the road who are going to be interacting in some way or another with autonomous vehicles. And we try to build our sense of the possibility of futures from that. We work hand in hand with the technologists, especially as I'll describe the, the software developers, the people who are working on the artificial intelligence for the vehicle being able to know what it's doing and where it's going, to try to shape how they make decisions about designing that technology. So we get quite engaged with the, the technical and engineering work. We also try to develop new concepts or ideas for services in the future of what might be able to be um, supporting humanity as we develop more of these um, vehicles. More directly on an everyday basis, we go out and we do a lot of little mini field studies. And over time, these are adding up to a deeper sort of ethnographic appreciation of what happens on the road and in the streets and among drivers. So I think of my people, if you like, as travelers, as people who move about in, in the way that they experience and live through the world um, in, in the process of mobility. So for an autonomous vehicle, the future looks kind of like this. And I can tell you, we're roughly today right there in the middle. For an autonomous vehicle, the trajectory of what's happening is first we have to be able to drive down a highway in a single road and be able to keep our speed, keep our location on that road, and obviously not hit anything around us and not get hit by anybody around us. That one, the single lane highway driving, is pretty much a solved problem. It's not technologically, there's, there's not anything particularly left to figure out there. All the vehicles are moving at the same speed, and what's great about highways is except for the occasional deer that might run across or something like that, very unlikely that you're going to have any intersecting traffic. The highway multi-lane situation starts to become more complex, and there's a number of, of developers and developments now that can do this pretty well. But this is where an autonomous vehicle or self-driving car would need to be able to navigate and figure out about making lane changes. So I, understanding whether there's another vehicle um, coming, but also at what speed and who else might be merging into that lane. And you even have to stop and ask, well, what, why would it change lanes? What, what kind of is going to motivate it to want to move around on the road? Uh, but there's reasons that might get built into that. But the real challenge, and where many of us are focused, and in my lab in Silicon Valley, all of our focus has been focused on city driving. And if you think about cities or any kind of urban environment, these are very interaction-rich environments. They're full of intersecting roads, 
and they're full of bicycles and pedestrians and all sorts of different kinds of road users that we have to navigate. So there's the people side of that, but there's also a whole mess of, of different kinds of signage and signals and things that have to be discerned. And of course, an autonomous vehicle needs to know the difference of one kind of sign from another and to be able to read that and know where it's going. So that's kind of the future of, of where things are headed. How are we going to get there? So this now is the one most technical part, and then from here we go back to what, what is more comfortable in my world. This is a, an, a map of the artificial intelligence, the brains, if you like, of an autonomous vehicle. It's built on a simple model um, that's very common in artificial intelligence. Some of you in this audience may be very familiar with it, of sensing the world and then reasoning and learning about the world and where people are and where it is in it, and then being able to take an action. And this model is uh, one that artificial intelligence equates with a cognitive model of human beings. Now, whether it actually maps to how human beings go about this or not, and there's plenty of philosophers and social theorists who might argue with this, it works pretty well for getting um, self-actuating, self self-directed um, equipment and machines to do what they need to do on the road. So to go a little level deeper, the first thing that an autonomous vehicle needs to do is it needs to be able to sense things. This is where we have all the technology of radar, LIDAR, cameras, all the sensing technology that can take in information from the world. We then enter into that very complex set of the reasoning and learning. Based on what it sensed, it needs to now perceive, in other words, interpret and begin to make sense of that kind of data that it sensed. So simple things like, I see an object. Can I identify what kind of object that is? Can I identify, and I always do this, I start to anthropomorphize as if I'm the autonomous vehicle. But for now, we'll go with it. Can I, can I identify which of those objects are static and which are, are dynamic? That would seem like it should be kind of straightforward. If I see a bicycle, it's obviously dynamic. If I see a car driving, it's obviously dynamic. But what about a bus that's stopped? I have to be able to understand, is that a bus, but is it about to get going again? Am I supposed to go around it, or do I stay behind it? So there's a lot in the perception. Once we have the perception, we have to put that against something. And what we put it against is some sort of maps of the world. We need to know where we are based on a priori information about what that environment is, but then put it together with um, <clears throat> models about what I see in the world now. So uh, 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 a very detailed map, the kind of maps that the AV use, might know about the curbs and the trash cans and the hedges and things like that, but it would have to know that now there is an additional object and that's a parked car on the side of the road. So it puts all that together to know where other objects are and it has to be able to know where it is too in some very precise kinds of ways. And it wants to know where it is vis-a-vis -vis the other objects. Finally, once it's done all that, it can now make a decision. And think about it, it makes decisions about 10 times every second. So it is constantly updating what's going on around me. But it makes decisions so that it can decide, plan, and then, and then create a path for what it's going to do next and where it's going to do, uh, where it's going to go and whether it's free to go. Once it has made that decision, then it transfers that over into the control side. And this is where the more traditional parts of car technology are, like, are going to pick up on it. Now it has to act and it has to be able to act on all of those decisions and the, the stuff that went before. So, with that in mind, let's go back then to thinking about why do we care about the social and cultural in the context of all this. <clears throat> Let me just catch up here with some notes, make sure I'm not um, leaving behind some things. Okay, so let's start with this question about sort of self and autonomy. Again, an autonomous vehicle offers or promises this great liberation, right? It's the penultimate in freedom. 
We're going to be able to go anywhere we want, whenever we want, and on top of that, we're going to be freed from being engaged in these driving tasks so that we can do other things. So what do we see here? This was an artistic installation by the artist James Bridal. Some of you may have seen this. And what it represents is a vehicle that's, tra that's trapped inside some lines. And the trick here, you can't actually, I can't see it very well, I hope you have a better shot than I do, is that there's dotted lines on the edges of that circle, but solid lines in the middle. An autonomous vehicle, of course, is going to obey all the laws. And a law tells us that you can't cross a solid line. So you can cross into it because if it got in via the, the broken, excuse me, the broken lines, but now it can't cross back out. Any person, of course, would be able to quickly see the situation and know they could get out. These sorts of fables are starting to appear more and more. This was a piece from the Academy of, um, of Computer, Computing Machinery, the ACM. And it was a sort of um, tale about the future with these robo-taxis, where a person gets into the robo-taxi, and the virtual personal assistant inside that taxi starts chatting them up, seems to know all about them. Hey, Joe, how you doing? Hey, uh, yeah, I already know where you're going. I know why you're going there. I know that you had a fight with your wife last night. Uh, raising these questions of what is it really going to be? What are they going to know? How are they going to know? And, 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 and what will that feel like? And finally, uh, the guru of user experience and a collaborator of ours, uh, Don Norman, wrote a piece on April 1st, note the date, about an autonomous vehicle um, inside of a roundabout, and it gets trapped. It's just circling around and around, and as his fable goes, uh, they find you know, an unconscious person sitting in the car 14 hours later as this car finally runs out of gas. Of course, the future will be electric, so it'll just have to run out of uh, uh, electric piece. So what I find so evocative about these stories is that they point to everyday dramas, and they go counter to that narrative about the grand liberatory promise of self-driving cars. They're sort of an absurdist, existential, no-exit kind of picture. So in fact, what these stories are ultimately about is less the car and more about us. It's us who might be trapped. So the question is, who gains or loses in autonomy? And in what kind of way? And what's the relationship, really, between the autonomy of a machine and our autonomy? So this was a question that we took up in a study that we did at Nissan. It was a study that was led by a part-time team member in my group, Eric Staten. Eric is a PhD candidate in the History, Anthropology, and Science, Technology, and Society program at MIT. And he's a part-time member of our group. Uh, this actually portion of the talk is about to be published, uh, Eric and I and another colleague of ours, Jing Yi Zheng, in the upcoming um, EPIC conference proceedings. So in order to um, set up our study, first I need to tell you about some, some work that we've done at our lab um, to develop a system that's called Seamless Autonomous Mobility, or SAM. And what SAM does is it's a system to remotely support remotely monitor and supervise and then support when they need it autonomous vehicles. So think a little bit like air traffic control for autonomous vehicles. And this is a system that we developed in collaboration with uh, NASA Ames Research. It's the same technology that they use for interplanetary robots. So you'll learn a little bit more about it in a video I'm going to show.
a little bit about Sam. What we wanted to know was something about how people might react and respond if they realized that there was now not just the autonomous vehicle that they're sitting inside of and themselves who could do something, but this third extra party that's sitting off somewhere out there in the ether. The practical reason that we want to explore this is that we're helping develop the system in terms of asking the question of what kind of communication and information exchange might be needed, if any, between the mobility manager at a distance and any um, passenger that might be in the vehicle. So uh, to set this up, what we did is we used a 360-degree simulator that we have in our lab that allows somebody to sit in a shell of a car and feel like they are now in a driving. It's completely immersive in that they're driving. We asked them to um, act as if they, or we told them you're on your way to this meeting. Oh, by the way, this is the information you're gonna need for the meeting. You're gonna arrive there pretty quick. So if you don't have it, you probably have some homework to do. They would have their cell phone or computer or something. They might wanna get some of that work done. Um, and that they should just sort of drive around and we help them get used to that. And they're told that there is this remote capability, this remote monitor, and they have a display right there where they can access and see information about whether that remote uh, mobility manager is being called or anything, and if they ever need anything, that they could call over to the remote manager. And we wanted to see what would happen if they encounter some obstacles. Would they take control themselves or would they wait for the mobility manager to do uh, their job? And how long might it take and would they want information or what would that feel like? Again, those were the practical questions that we were exploring. Uh, and then we followed it with interviews to understand something about how that helped people think about and shape their sense of what autonomy meant. So let me show you a brief video here of this participant. And as we see, she is arriving at an obstacle, which is a construction zone. And you can't really see very well, but there's a, um, a flagman who's behind one of those um, barriers and is going to come out. We see her on her phone, presumably doing the homework. Maybe she's sending an email, not really sure what she's doing. The car's waiting while they get, they, they access the onboard sensors and they figure out a new path and they decide and tell the car what it should do. And what you saw there is for a moment she took hold of the wheels as if she was thinking, uh, I'm, I've had enough of this, I'm ready to take control. And just then the car started to go again. So in this case she actually let it do its job. Now, we took about 14 people through this, and again, we spent time with them both before and after to talk about not just the details of what happened, but kind of what it felt like and what it meant and how it made them think about what autonomous futures might look like. And one of the things we learned is that for people as they were experiencing it today, they thought of this autonomy in very contextual ways. Yeah, it would be great when I'm commuting every day on these miserable roads that we have in Silicon Valley and traffic is horrendous, but maybe not so much for a weekend when I'd rather be out driving myself. Or it would be great when I'm going to work by myself, but maybe I wouldn't really want to have my kids and family in the car with me when it's autonomous. So they, it had them reflect a lot on what kind of role they have as drivers as people who maybe own vehicles and certainly are controlling the vehicle. And what we began to explore was more the ways in which driving itself is a way for people to perform the act of care. And what will it mean if that shifts in the future and some of that is taken away or they're asked to play a different kind of role? Another thing we heard from people is trying to get a sense of what they thought about that kind of human in the loop um, support from somebody at a distance. And what we found is how quickly they recognized that that person was performing a certain kind of labor. That was work that they were performing. So how did they think about that work? Well, the first thing is they actually didn't think about that person and pay much attention, of course, until something happened and there was a breakdown and suddenly then they were like reminded, oh yeah, that's right, there's this person, do I need them? One of the reactions that we heard is that they thought that person must be quite the expert. They're doing some really important stuff. They probably have all sorts of you know, complex technical information that they're dealing with. My situation's kind of simple. I don't really need to bother them with this. Why don't I just do what I need to do and leave them to do the more important stuff? We also heard some people feel exactly the opposite who thought, well, 
I think I could pretty easily resolve this and I know what to do, but meanwhile that person has a job to do and I don't want to take away their labor and take away what they're supposed to be doing and do it instead, so I'll just let them do the task they were hired to perform. They also start to think about the fact of these people being somebody in a workplace. What kind of information do they have? What kind of day are they having? Are they happy at work? Are they treated well? What kind of labor is it that they're performing? And one of the main things we heard is how people thought, or for many people, they felt some comfort in thinking, especially in these early days and thinking about autonomous vehicles, it would be nice to know that there would be somebody there who's in it with me when the occasion arrives, sort of a guardian angel who could help out in tough situations. So what emerged was that when faced with a possibility of relinquishing driving, it confronted people with that sense of their own account accountability and their own sense of identity, as well as the ways in which they were sort of performing a role and in, in doing something important themselves. And autonomy, therefore, was not really a unidirectional kind of thing. It wasn't that by going towards more self-driving cars, we're necessarily gaining liberty, but nor are we necessarily losing freedom. But it is a reconfiguration, again, between sort of self and others in a variety of ways. So now let's switch to the outside of the vehicle. And this is, frankly, where our group has spent a lot more time thinking about what happens between autonomous vehicles and people, other road users um, in, in the road. And what I want to focus on is how people interact with and interpret the world about, around them as they move about and how this kind of way of expecting certain things from certain environments and certain places shapes their everyday experience. So <clears throat> let's take a look at how certain things work and, and how we might begin to look with sort of anthropological eyes at understanding the variety of patterns of movement and, and expectations in different settings. Here's a, what might be considered a sort of typical um, small North, uh, Northern California town setting very pedestrian-friendly kind of area, a lot of restaurants and bars and places uh, for people to go and walk through. And we see some interesting interactions, like that pedestrian in the car that's going through what, what's going on. I think this is a little squished. I hope you're getting a good view. Um, and the car is sort of navigating a four-way stop. Now, four-way stops are potentially a very challenging problem for autonomous vehicles, because they have to be able to figure out when to go. And so what we do, of course, at a four-way stop is we try to figure out who came first and then we have rules of going in a certain order. Well, I can assure you, if you spend even a few minutes looking, those rules get broken all the time. But we're like figuring out together. We perceive from each other some sense of, oh, you're, you're distracted momentarily or you have something blocking you so I can go ahead and slip my turn in or I'm gonna go right behind this other car there's all sorts of ways in which we can do that and interpret the situation. And in fact, what we see if we look at this more carefully is that there's a whole lot of communication and interaction that goes on here. So this person is looking at that car. Now, when we look more carefully, we realize the driver is actually looking back at this Jeep to see about not losing his turn. These two have to figure out not only who got there first, but do they agree on who got there first and who should go? And then we have this nice interaction here where the woman stops the partner that she's walking with and that driver, meanwhile, sees them and there's an exchange of hand waves and, and gestures. So this is a, a kind of typical, I would say, way of interacting in a place like this. Again, it's fairly intimate, it's friendly, and uh, that would be a normal pattern of, of movement. Let's look at a different place, though, and see how different movement can be. So here's um, a large boulevard, a roundabout, in uh, Tehran, Iran. A zebra crosswalk, but what happens at the zebra crosswalk is everybody just keeps moving. The cars keep going, the pedestrians keep going, people are walking in any number of different directions, driving their motorcycles. Obviously, the pattern of interaction is really remarkably different in a place like that. 
So if you, if you try to wait at a zebra crosswalk, you, you'd probably still be waiting. You're not going to get very far. Let's look at another Iranian city. This is Mashhad in the northeast corner of Iran. Check out the guy at the top of the video, sort of towards the right. What you see here, though, people walking on the inside of the road, again, the cars weaving in and out, the pedestrians in all sorts of different locations, um, crossing, sort of a steady stream of movement as everybody moves about, and the guy almost getting... I kid you not, this video was within minutes of taking this video. This is what you see. What's remarkable here is that Mashhad is actually a pilgrimage site. It's very likely that many people, maybe not the taxi drivers, but uh, many of the people who are in that setting might not be from there at all. They might just be visitors, because it gets pilgrims from across the Shia Islam, um, Islamic world who come there, but people can adapt, as people were very good at understanding and picking up very quickly what local conventions might be. We might not always choose to follow them, that's a kind of risky place to do that, but at least we can begin to sort of fall into the patterns. So that's another kind of place. Let's look yet again, or listen in this case, to a different kind of setting. Again, let's think about what, it, what it's like for people to have expectations of movement in different places. So this is just going to be an audio, so um, hopefully you'll be able to hear um, this brief conversation with a woman at the Stanford campus. Usually, at least when I'm at Stanford, I feel like I always have the right of way, and so I'll kind of mean mug cars if they start turning while I'm walking. What does mean mug mean? Uh, like give them a little bit of an evil eye, okay. menacing, like you can't do that. Yeah. Because especially if you're like a Stanford employee or student, you're like, I have to get to wherever I'm going. Yeah. So. Yeah, I follow all of the traffic rules off campus. Yeah. Like I would never cross the street as a pedestrian if there was a red light or something. Oh, there's not lights on campus, yeah. there's just stop signs. And so you always kind of feel like, well, you can stay stopped and I'll go. So there's a few things I want to draw your attention to here. First, I love that last statement. You're a stop sign and I always figure you just stop so you can stay stopped and I'll go. She assumes that as a pedestrian, she has the right of way. You can just as easily imagine some driver arriving at a stop sign saying, well, I just stopped, therefore it's my turn to go. So we find that this very clear sign, the signal that says stop, is actually rather ambiguous because it doesn't tell us anything else than stop. It doesn't tell us when to go and in what order or anything like that. It has to be figured out. A second thing is that we learn that she uses these social signals to try to discipline the other road users. She mean mugs them. She tells them they're doing something wrong. But then she not acknowledges that what would be wrong in this place would be very different just two blocks away. She says when she's in downtown Palo Alto, which is just a couple of blocks from where we were standing, she would be doing everything completely differently and she would follow the rules and not assume she has the right of way. Now, whether things actually go this way all the time or not, uh, and I'm betting they don't always go <laughs> this way, um, the, the, idea, the, the point I'm making is that people have certain expectations of behavior that vary based on place. And so how do people understand what kind of place it is? Is a map enough to tell you what kind of place it is? And how much are places really socially created and socially defined? So, that's one aspect of the broader sense of places, but then you also have people creating very localized meanings re relative to certain places. And I'm reminded here of the vast anthropological literature on place making and on place naming, where people ascribe particular kinds of meaning to places that can get passed on in, in cultural practices and through stories in certain kinds of ways. So here we're walking with a participant, again in a different small town in Northern California. And she arrives at this intersection here that we're gonna cross, and she's telling us a story about these cars that are coming from, a sorry for the wavy <laughs> camera work here, that are coming from the left there about how dangerous this particular place in this town feels. And she claims that both she and her, her neighbors and friends that, that also walk downtown have felt the same way about it. Her explanation is that those cars there are coming off a highway, which is sort of 
topsy-turvy around the corner, you can't see, and that this is the first time they're coming to a stop, and that therefore they haven't acclimated to what it's like there. Here's another setting. This one is also from Sao Paulo, Brazil. We're with a driver, and we arrive at this intersection, and he had previously told us a story about this one intersection he tries to avoid at all costs. He's a professional driver, and he claims that other people avoid that particular intersection, drivers that he knows about. And the reason is because of safety in that case has to do with that, that being a particular intersection that's prone to carjackings and purse snatchings. People will break the window and, and grab purses. Now, what I find so important and interesting about these kinds of, of views is there's absolutely nothing observably remarkable about them. There's no way to arrive and know anything about these kinds of experience or expectations of those settings without hearing from people and hearing their stories. So it's when we hear and learn from people about what they expect that we begin to see how the world is sort of mapped out and designed already by, by people as they move about in particular ways that really shape their movement patterns. So the history, the story for autonomous vehicles is we have to be asking ourselves constantly as these vehicles move about and are interacting with varieties of people in varieties of different sorts of settings, when is the right time to stop and when is the right time to go? What kinds of actions and what kind of movement profile? And should we consider whether we actually need a different way of communicating with other people on the road as we travel about? And how varied might those communications need to be? So, where does all this bring us? As I said, I've, I've been exploring this question of the challenges to the development of AV from the way that people interact on the road, how they make sense of place, how they move through place, and what it means to them to drive and to perform care. Or rather, what I've really been exploring probably is more what the challenges might be for people once we have more of these autonomous vehicles on the road when they're subtly behaving likely in different ways. And if you were invited here or thought you were coming to an engineering talk with the technical challenges, what I do now is conclude by telling you about the ways in which we're trying to address this technically. Again, we work with the technologists to try to help them build the systems so that they're going to be able to learn to perceive and make decisions in ways that account for some of these social expectations and patterns. We're also exploring and looking at developing and testing different kinds of communication devices, including potentially new communication devices on the outside of cars to communicate to other road users about what those um, autonomous vehicles might be doing. And they can know whether they should walk or not walk. But actually, you came to an anthropology talk sponsored by this amazing organization, the School for Advanced Research, and what I myself am most interested in, ultimately, is less how to solve the problems of getting the self-driving cars to run comfortably on the roads, but what it will mean to our social futures, what kind of designs for the future we are engaging in. Cars are just one instant broader set of shifts in the relationship between humans and technology. Talk of AI, of robots, and the possibility of jobless futures, of virtual realities abound. What I've been aiming to do here is provide an extended engagement with the notion of autonomy. The thought I want to leave you with is this. Autonomy is not an attribute intrinsic to a single entity. Autonomy is rendered through the connections among and between people and objects, connections that give rise to action. It's our actions that are autonomous, our abilities to act, and not the things themselves. So designing human-machine interactions for the future means designing for our relational world. And what I find so compelling about the case of cars is the awesome extent and scale of our experience with them, their pervasiveness and their mundaneness today. As AI goes, or as robots go, these are essentially robots, they are the most consequential, I believe, precisely because they're neither occasional, they're not that occasional algorithm driving some decision for something you might do once or twice a year, but, and they're not rarefied. They're absolutely persistent and, and pervasive in our lives. 
Even for those who don't drive themselves or live the kind of urban existence that allows them to largely avoid ever being inside a car-sized vehicle such as this because they walk or bicycle or use buses and mass transit, engaging with these vehicles all the time in their daily existence. So designing for futures with increasingly automated cars and increasingly automated systems of all kinds means engaging with a world of social relationships. So as technological objects, automated cars reconfigure our potential to act and it's that where we should be focused in terms of thinking about designing the future. Thank you.